I was kind of hesitant showing this because I've always felt that this is the greatest comic book ever published, uh, but I'll go ahead and pull it out. We've got three of us here and we're gonna combine forces to give you hopefully a great show. Each of us is gonna present one book in five different areas. We're gonna start off with Superhero Silver Age Grail and I'll kick it off. This of course is Tales of Suspense number 39. It's well known because it's the first appearance of Iron Man and something that most folks don't know. And in fact, my co-presenter Ben here taught me about this. Iron Man right there. You see quotation marks on this side. You hmm. don't see quotation marks on this side. That's because many of these books, the way they were cut, they kind of depended. Sometimes you'll get that double quotation mark over here. Sometimes you only see one and sometimes none. So this is actually the least favorable version of the Iron Man here. All right, so uh, my first book is Fantastic Four number one. And this is a, a kind of a major book because this is really the book that set Marvel apart from Marvel. <laughs> Actually, Marvel existed in the golden age and it was sort of falling apart. The company was falling apart. It, this was sort of the last kick in the can for for Stan Lee to kind of bring back Marvel. Uh, they were, before this, they were doing monster related comics. And this was them going back into superheroes because they saw that DC comics was doing well with their showcase books that they were bringing back uh, Flash, bringing back uh, Green Lantern, bringing back Wonder Woman. Stan Lee was given the directive by Goodman uh, to basically say, hey, do what you think is best, make your own story and make something cool that will get collectors watch uh, reading again. And he came out with Fantastic Four and the rest is history. The Silver Age is dominated because of this one book. Well, for my Silver Age superhero, it's um, maybe not as common as what people would pick, but uh, since I'm a, a Timely fan, I like Submariner. Uh, this is actually my, my favorite Silver Age superhero book, uh, FF number four. Uh, came out February 1962, reintroducing the Submariner and the Fantastic Four, uh, Jack Kirby art. Everybody knows this book. A lot of people like the five because they're Doom fans. There's probably more Doom fans and Subby fans, but uh, this has always been the book for me. This has an FF pinup page uh, with uh, Reed Richards as well, as they were doing random pinups at that time. So if you get this book, make sure it has the pinup because it could be missing. Okay, let's go from the Silver Age Grails to the Golden Age Superhero Grails. And Alan, kick us off. So my Golden Age uh, Superhero Grail is All-Star Comics and number eight. This is the first appearance of Wonder Woman in comic. And um, what people don't realize is actually Wonder Woman is kind of the first all around superhero, oh, female superhero. Like there were previous superheroes to her, like uh, Scarlett O'Neill, who is uh, like a one that could turn invisible. There was uh, women heroes like um, Miss Fury, but Wonder Woman was really the one where they had she had superpowers, she had an origin story, she had all these, all the things that we kind of associate with a classic superhero. So she's kind of the first all-around female superhero. Um, and the sad thing is, she's not even on the cover. <laughs> she didn't make the cover in her first book. Uh, I was kind of hesitant showing this uh, because I've always felt that this is the greatest comic book ever published, uh, but I'll go ahead and pull it out. Uh, this is my Marvel Comics number one from 1939. This is the October version. Casting, we can do a, a whole show on this book. <laughs> I like this book more uh, because of the publication and distribution and the, I guess, controversy between Submariner and his first appearance, Newsstand versus you know, the motion picture funnies one, but you know, it's not a list type superhero characters like Batman and Spider-Man, etc. It's got the human fur torch and Submariner. It's pretty much the, the start of the empire that's going to come. This book looks like a pulp and it's always looked like a pulp. And that's because of the unique color, uh, step colors that were used to print this book. Uh, it had a lot of printing problems as everyone knows, but this book was printed using process colors, magenta, uh, cyan, 
black and yellow instead of primary colors, red, blue, yellow, and black. Um, so it gave it a wider chromatic range. So, I mean, the, the blues that you see and the purples are just very unique to it. Uh, it's very difficult to match the color touching on this. So a lot of copies that are restored, the color touch is terrible. Uh, this is actually the one of the worst books that you can try to color touch because it usually doesn't look too good. There's not too many times where this book comes in second fiddle when you're talking about Tiley books, but it will today. But it's my version of Captain America comics number one. It, of course, is the first appearance of Captain America and Bucky and the Red Skull. It's likely also the most famous World War II cover that there is as well. So, of course, you got Captain America hitting the jaw of Hitler. And it's something that most folks don't know, but if you look at the cover closely, you can see it, is there's all these little details in the back that shows that we're in war. So this is a, in Germany. It's a live broadcast to the U.S. It says uh, U.S. Munition Works is being blown up by the Germans. So I thought that was a really cool way to convey this is like Hitler's headquarters that uh, Cap is coming into. By the way, it looks like there's like iron bars on this window. So you assume that Cap came in through that window and broke down those um, iron bars. Now it is time to move on to horror. And uh, Ben, you're going to start us off on the horror. The one that I picked is the one that uh, Steve Dicko drew. Uh, the cover to Strange Suspense Stories 19. Um, and I like it because it's one of the few Dicko covers where you could actually see a signature still. Um, most covers on the original art, they had signatures, but because of production, they were usually cut. Uh, even Schomburg signatures are not always shown on covers. But um, yeah, uh, you know, this is 1954 uh, by Charlton and Ditko. Uh, long before working for Atlas and Marvel, he did a lot of work for Charlton in the 1950s. Okay, so the book I have is uh, from 1953, and this is Chamber of Chills number 19. It's a Lee Elias cover. Um, it's a classic cover too, so among all the horror books, I would say this would come in at about the top 10. Uh, what I like about this particular book, not only is it classic, but it's classy. So oftentimes horror books can be pretty gruesome and you have people's faces blowing up and they're very violent, which is okay too. I have some of them, but this is super yeah. classy. And it's also noted, like, how do you know it's classy? It's because the skeleton has cufflinks and you don't get much classier than that. And I want to pass the torch on to Alan. Alan, among the three of us, I think you are the horror specialist. Well, I'm the horror specialist without that awesome book. To me, that is actually the number one pre-code horror book. So um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm humbled. Um, <laughs> so the one I chose though is kind of, this is not necessarily the most valuable or the most sought after book from the pre-code horror genre, but it is one that I like. And I like it because I'm a good girl art collector. So I like good girl art. And this sort of is the match between good girl and horror. And that's why I like it. So it's uh, Mr. Mystery, which actually is a great horror title. It's a it's a fairly scarce horror horror title. Um, the artwork was done by uh, uh, Ross Andro and Mike uh, Esposito. Ross Andro is uh, famous for doing Wonder Woman. This is a great cover because it has so many classic elements to it. So you got the the woman in distress. Now, kind of a red dress. Well, you know, it's kind of questionable if it's a red dress, but she's in bondage, of course, so that's always good. Um, and you got the, the, the really great uh, element where you see the painting of her, but in the painting, she's stabbed. But in real life, she's not stabbed yet, but he's going to correct that flaw. <laughs> so it's just got that classic horror element to it. Uh, it's Mr. Mystery number four. So now we're going to go to round four, and round four is good girl art. So I'm going to kick this one off. And this is Seven Seas number four, Seven Seas Comics number four. And the artist is Matt Baker. Um, a buddy of mine, John K. Snyder III, who has worked on several comic books, including comic books for DC like Suicide Squad, he actually lives in, in my town in Harrisonburg. And so he did a reproduction of it. And I asked him, I said, John, what was the toughest part about recreating Baker? He said, it's the hair. And so if you are going to draw it, he's like, you make sure you get that right. So I'm actually gonna cheat on this one a little bit. Okay, but you'll see. <laughs> so I'm gonna show, uh, this is uh, 
Spirit Comics uh, number 22. And this is Will Eisner. This is considered the grail of um, good girl art for femme fatale. Okay, so it's a very specific genre of good girl art. Uh, you got the girl and she's like placing the dagger into her stocking or maybe taking it out of her stocking. We're not really sure, but she's definitely doing something nefarious. And um, this is just, it has these great blues that kind of like fade in and it's just, it's, it's really, really well done. But the reason I say I'm going to cheat on this one is I'm actually going to show three books. This was a, a kind of a little run within the Spirit collection that was all good girl art. Number 21, which is another femme fatale, just a different type of femme fatale. And then we have Spirit number 20. So it's, a, it, it's sort of like a mini collection within the Spirit run that you, you have to get in order to get the, the Will Eisner <laughs> uh, Good Girl Art collection. So this is just, and this is the, the pinnacle of those books. I'm not a good girl art collector or a horror collector really, but uh, I do have a fair amount of bondage covers. So I'm going to use this next book, which I think more than qualifies as good girl art. In fact, there is uh, themes of horror and war as, long, as well as good girl art uh, in it. And this is Keston's favorite book of all time, or favorite cover at least. Um, and I happen to have a copy of Suspense 3. Um, quite possibly Alex Schomburg's um, pinnacle cover. Newsstand date is April 44. Uh, I have seen one copy date stamp February 11th, 44 as the earliest. So I do know this was out as early as February 44. Here's a fun fact that many people may not know. Uh, and I do have to give John Burke uh, credit, the great collector. In the mid nineties, he came out with a, an article in the Comic Buyers Marketplace this cover is a reflection of a text story in all new comics number eight which is cover dated may 44. if you look up that harvey book of, of may of 44 all new comics number eight it has a semi swipe of this cover also done by alex schomburg uh, which cover did he do first I, I don't know you know he probably did one and then started the other and you know, enhance this one, obviously, because this is the better cover, a rare and expensive one. But if you have a raw copy of all new number eight, turn to the text story. The text story is a reflection of this cover. And it explains how this girl is the, uh, is the daughter of a French general. This took place in North Africa, uh, this scene, uh, I think Morocco. And she basically gets kidnapped by Nazis and she's about to be sacrificed here. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are down to our last round, and Alan is going to kick us off, and this is the wild card, so uh, we could choose anything. So I, I'm going to choose uh, Blue Beetle number 54. Um, the reason I chose this book of all the books that I could have chose, it, when you get to know me, you get to know good girl art, because I love good girl art. So this is a, <laughs> a good girl art, plus it's a Seduction of the Innocent uh, comic. So... Um, a Seduction of the Innocent was a book that was written by Frederick Wortham that led to the end of the golden age of comics. And that is, you know, it was a very significant book. Like literally months after the book was released, the Comic Code Authority came into play and comics as we know them, <laughs> and like uh, from the golden age ended, um, which was kind of tragic. But it was books like this that led to that downfall uh, because this was according to Frederick Wortham, very salacious. It, it, you know, it has this sort of suggestive thing where she's getting naked, um, you know, but the, there's actually an error to this book, uh, which a lot of people don't realize. But if you look at it, if you look in the, it's a, a woman standing in front of a mirror and in the mirror, you see that she's wearing a bra, but when you see her in real life, she's actually not wearing a bra. Uh, and you got the murderer coming in the, in the corner here. I have a book here that I'm going to show that I bought off the 7-Eleven Spinner Racks in 1980. This is an early 1980 book. And I remember specifically choosing this book. And this is the exact same copy from 1980. It survived this whole time. Um, and it is the ever popular FF number 218, <laughs> which has absolutely no significance to anybody except <laughs> for me. Because this is the exact same copy about a good, very good. Uh, I remember seeing Spider-Man 
uh, on this cover and it was just action packed, very much like Schaumburg, which is probably a precursor to what I was going to collect. And I remember looking at it and go, I'm going to buy this one. Um, and uh, it stuck with me. And I remember reading it and reading it and reading it, you know, with my Coke Slurpees on the floor of my room. I have the original art page to page two right there. You see where my finger is? That's the original art to this book. And it's probably the best page in the book it's got the sandman here and the electro and you can kind of see it here but i got this a couple of years ago and i said i had to have it you know because this goes exactly with this this is probably the book that believe it or not where it's worth nothing to everybody else but i would make sure if there was a fire that i have to grab this because you know this is kind of like my childhood right here sentimental reasons you know, i currently have 12 copies that's my that's my random fun book uh, this particular book, I only have one copy of it, but it's uh, it actually comes back to a couple of themes that we talked about before. So we talked about uh, Submariner and we talked about Timely. For my money, this is the best Submariner cover that has ever been created. Something funny that folks may not know, it's like, you know, most people's faces, they're ovals. And he drew Submariner's face almost like a triangle. It's like if you added those angles up, they'd add up to 180 degrees, you know? Yeah. So, so we just scratched the surface of our collections. You can check out videos here. This is uh, my video. Uh, this is Ben's. This is Alan's. Thanks so much for joining us, and we hope to see you around real soon.